Welcome back to Daytime. We are with the Region of Durham Paramedic Services, and we're going to be learning about what's new and how to use the 911 calls appropriately. So, welcome to the show. Thank you. Why don't you tell us about what's coming up with, with Durham Paramedic Services? Uh, well, we're going through a lot of transition. In 2015, we changed our name from Emergency Medical Services to Paramedic Services to better reflect what our paramedics do for the community. And in the, we're currently trying to manage uh, the ever-growing demand for service. We've seen a huge jump in uh, the overall request for ambulance services since the region took over in 2000. And uh, next year, part of that um, process is to add a new station to um, the region. We're adding a new station in Sunderland community to better, better provide service to the residents of North Durham. And when you say you've seen a big jump, it, you told me a little bit during the break how big of a jump that was. Why don't you tell the viewers how large that is? Well, in 1999, which was the year before the region took over paramedic services for the residents, uh, we all the services in Durham region did about 33,000, 34,000 requests for service. So those are non-emergency and emergency calls. In uh, 2015, that number was 69,000. So we've seen over a over a twofold increase in uh, in the requests for service, and it creates an ever-growing demand on our paramedics and on the healthcare system in general. Why do you think that is? Why is there such a large increase? There's a number of reasons. One of the big reasons is the population in Durham Region has increased and as it increases so does demand for emergency services. Uh, another big reason is with the increase in population includes an aging population increase and another big part is with the healthcare system changing to a format where mo a lot of people are at home managing their health care needs through home care rather than uh, staying in the hospital for an illness we see our paramedics responding to those people on a regular basis so overall there's an increased demand for those reasons and because of the increased demand i would imagine that it's really important for viewers to understand when is the right time to call 911 yes absolutely we would like to encourage viewers to use 911 appropriately when they're having a real emergency uh, such as having a chest pain or heart attack or having a stroke or a friend's collapsed or something and we would like people to, you know, use alternate care pathways like urgent cares and seeing their family doctor for the less urgent, uh, emerg less urgent uh, issues they're dealing with. Makes a lot of sense. We have to be respectable, uh, re respective of your time too. So we are going to show us what happens on a call. Okay, so this is uh, Carrie and Penny. They're two of our advanced care paramedics with uh, paramedic services, and they're using a mannequin that we use for training. And um, currently, they're demonstrating how we would manage a patient in cardiac arrest or vital signs absent. And those are probably the we don't do those calls a lot every year. We do about 400, but um, they require. Uh, Obviously, the most intensive level of uh, care from the paramedics is we're trying to take someone whose heart stopped and restart it again for them. Okay, and so th that's the first thing they do. What what is the whole procedure? So when you find somebody that has been collapsed, well, w what you're seeing right now, uh, what you're filming right now, is is the middle of of managing someone in cardiac arrest. But the first step would be the 911 call, getting appropriate information, the paramedics arriving on scene, doing what we call a quick assessment or a primary assessment to determine what the immediate life threat is and manage those life threats. So in this case, Carrie and Penny found a patient who was collapsed, whose vital signs uh, were absent or heart had stopped, and what they've done uh, at this point is uh, Penny has, an, has intubated the patient's trachea which allows us to ventilate the patient uh, and give them a secure airway and Carrie is doing CPR and we have defibrillator pads attached to the patient's chest and a cardiac monitor defibrillator that is monitoring their rhythm and determining if the patient's heart rhythm needs to be shocked. And so could they demonstrate what it's like on this, on this model well, using a defibrillator or do you have to wait? Uh, no, we could sh we could probably show that right now. Uh, Carrie's pr doing appropriate CPR right now, and so now she's going to just check to make sure that the patient uh, can be defibrillated. There's only two rhythms that can be defibrillated, either through public access defibrillators or the fire department or our own machines, and those are uh, one's called pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and the other is ventricular fibrillation. Those are the ones that require shocking. The other ones we have to do CPR, provide uh, medications, and breathing for. So at this point, Carrie's going to shock the patient right now. And when we shock the patient, we are delivering electrical energy. So if you notice, neither Carrie nor Penny had their hands on the patient because they have to be safe as well. So we kind of all, all hands are off and we shock the patient. And now that that's done, they start CPR. The most important part of um, managing a patient in cardiac arrest is really good quality CPR. And that is something we'd like to stress to the residents of the region as well, is if they know CPR and they can provide it to somebody who's collapsed, whose heart has stopped, that is the most important part in any emergency trying to, to help these people. Do you think that most organizations should have defibrillators on site? 
Yeah, we we're strongly encourage you know, uh, lar especially large corporations that have a lot of employees to have public access defibrillators. We work closely with our base hospital program at Lakeridge Health, and they manage the public access defib program throughout the region. And we have, so for example, there's public access defibrillators at, sw at local public swimming pools, hockey rinks, golf clubs, areas like that where we see these things c can occur. And certainly, um, you know, GM has uh, defibrillators in in their facility as well. It's something we would encourage anybody to do. And when you're waiting for the paramedic services, and, and let's say that you're not really knowledgeable about CPR, should you attempt it? Should you? Well, we would first encourage anybody to take a CPR course. I think that's the most important part, either through Heart and Stroke or, or St. John Ambulance or Red Cross First Aid or any of the other agencies. Anybody should be taking uh, CPR courses. Uh, uh, for example, babysitters have to have CPR in order to be a, you know, a certified babysitter. That kind of idea. And um, if people don't know CPR, probably the most important message we'd like to get across is when you see an emergency, please call 911 because that time. If you take five minutes to call, that's five minutes that we're not en route responding to try and help you. Right. If you call right away and we can start coming right away, we, we reduce that window of response and that allows us to get there quicker, which hopefully will mean a better outcome for the patient. Absolutely. So we're going to have more with the Region of Durham Paramedic Services when we return. Stay with us. Welcome back to daytime. We are with the Region of Durham Paramedic Services talking with two amazing paramedics. And before the break, you were actually performing CPR for quite some time. Yeah. So, how does it feel when you have to work so hard? I know you're saving a life in many cases, but is it tiring? Yeah, it does get tiring, and we do try to switch out our CPR every two minutes to try to eliminate that um, fatigue that you may start to feel in your arms because we want to make sure that you are delivering the most adequate CPR possible by not allowing ourselves to get too over fatigued. When we're on a call, we do have, um, sometimes we'll have other allied services or we'll have another paramedic crew that will enable us on the every two minute mark to switch out and take a turn at the CPR to ensure that the depth, the rate, and the quality of the CPR is 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 the best because we want to make sure that the heart is primed um, to ex receive the shock that we're going to give it if we do find that the patient is in that shockable rhythm. Why don't you walk us through some of the equipment then that you use? Sure. Okay. So right now this is our uh, defibrillator. This is a Zolex series. It is a biphasic defibrillator. Um, it delivers a shock to the heart. So what we do is we put on these pads here that you can see on the mannequin and it will read the rhythm that the patient's heart is in. And if it, we do determine that it is a shockable rhythm, um, we will charge the energy and then we would deliver the shock to the patient. And when do you know that you need to put in IV? Is that something you do right away as well? Well, that is something that um, we do de depending on our level of care. We have primary care paramedics and we also have advanced care paramedics. Advanced care paramedics are the ones that will initiate the IV. First and foremost, we try to get good quality upfront CPR started. Um, and then from there, we start with the defib monitor the rhythm, defibrillate as necessary, and then we work our way up from there. So once we start our CPR, um, we will do that, analyze the rhythm, shock or not shock, and then from there we can start worrying about the airway um, and then the IV access to start administering drugs. When you're talking about the, the advanced paramedics, is that how they would partner up the paramedics who are riding together that day? We generally try to keep um, one advanced care, one primary care on the truck. Um, so that we have, uh, you know, a good spread of that quality of care with, throughout the region. Um, sometimes two primary cares will work together as well, but um, we always try to have, if need be, they can always call for backup for advanced care paramedics to back them up. And speaking of backup, you're also a paramedic. And tell us, how long have you been a paramedic? About 21, 22 years now. What has that experience been like for you? And has you, have you been in Durham the whole entire time? I have. I originally started up with Quartha Lakes, which was Lindsay and District Service, which was the Port Perry station. Then in 2000, with the download, um, I chose to come down here full time, which was a fantastic idea. It's been great. They've been great to me. I have no complaints about this profession. It has been 
just a blast the whole entire time and I still love the road. It's great. Oh, and what are some of the most common reasons that people have called the paramedic that need assistance? Is it from the collapsing car accidents? Collapse, car accidents, diabetic emergencies, shortness of breath. We have a lot of COPDers out there, heart attacks, um, cardiac arrest, drowning, you name it. We so respond. have you saved a lot of lives over these years? I'm, a few. <laughs> <laughs> that must feel really amazing. It's fantastic, especially we've had a program where we've been able to meet our patients yeah. that have been resuscitated and that's probably the most rewarding. So I noticed something as well at the front. You have this bag of goodies. What is in a paramedic's first aid bag? Uh, well, the bag that you see on the floor there right now is uh, what we call our drug bag, and that will house all of our cardiac arrest drugs, as well as what we call our symptom relief medications. Um, it has the bag for the IV administration kit um, that we use to start up the IV, and just anything extra along the way that we might need. So we do have the two different things. Um, levels of care of med uh, medications in, within those bags that we do use. Um, other than that, um, that's it for that one. We do have more bags. This is not the end all and be all, but we do have a bigger, um, a big blue bag that has all of the adjuncts that you see here being used to manage the patient's airway and breathing. Now, you drive the truck from time to time? I do drive the truck, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what kind of experience and training do you have to have? Because you have to drive at high speeds to get to these individuals. We do do, uh, we require to have an F class license. Um, when you take the paramedic program and to get hired and you have to maintain that um, and then we do do some driver certification and training when you get hired within the service um, from there it's it's you know it's just regular driving skills and it is fun to drive the truck I'm not gonna lie but, <laughs> um, but you still have to make sure you maintain road safety and the safety of the pedestrians and the other cars on the road at all times even when you're running emergency calls absolutely and is there one favorite part of your job that you have that gives you great joy oh, I'm gonna say you know obviously the saving the patients and then like Penny had mentioned earlier when you get the chance to meet them has always been one of the biggest things um, I would say probably one of the highest points was when I got to deliver a baby. You did? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> when was this? Oh, um, it was years ago now, but um, it was in the back of our truck and it was a little bit unexpected, but you it, did it. it went well oh. and it, it was great. It that's was great amazing. Noise. Thanks yeah, so much for being well. here and sharing your experience. Thanks. And that's the end of our show. Until next time, keep well and thank you for watching Daytime.